again, it's me, Michelle. As you notice, you know, I have a new look. And so welcome to Facebook Live Coffee Talk. Today, I am extremely honored. I reach out, I reach out to uh, but Tabuli when last year, actually, it was in December. I came across her profile and we connected and she is this amazing woman. And you don't want to miss this show because she's going to bring a lot of value to this show. So she is a problem solver and she is also a law of attraction coach. She graduated from Princeton University with an, a, a, an a, a, B in sociology. Um, she graduated with a cum laude. She earned her JD um, Juris Doctor from Columbia University. Um, but Tabli is a dynamic and gifted speaker, mediator, workshop facilitator, and a coach who strives to create unique and transformative experience for her audience and clients. So she earned a graduate certificate in leadership and executive coaching and an MS in leadership and organization development from the University of Texas and da at Dallas. She, is, she has uh, one, two, three, four, lovely dog. And I just met one of them. Uh, it's Bambi. Bambi might jump onto the show once in a while. She, uh, Batabli is a traveler, uh, but in YouTube, podcast, singing, singer, songwriter, and guitarist, and who loves to perform on New York City subway platform. Wow. <laughs> so without further ado, let's welcome Batabli. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, Michelle. It's ugh, such a fabulous thing. It's been a really long time since I've done this. And also, um, I've been looking forward to our conversation for a really long time. Um, I remember when you reached out to me last year about doing this, and I've been anticipating it since then. So I'm really excited for this moment. <laughs> yeah, I remember that first day when we were talking on the phone, and I was actually on my way to work, and, and we just could, they couldn't put the phone down. I kept talking to you because we we both came from New York and I, I was talking um, about like our experience in my experience in New York and we were talking about like different places and there's a lot of connection between you and I. Oh yeah we share so much in common it really was amazing um, yeah. in terms of life. We actually switched coast or switched yes. coasts. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on the west coast and I guess you um, you know, came from New York to the West Coast and I went the other direction. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, life is so funny how, how sometimes it operates, right? It would go in different direction. And the people who come into our life, well, we just somehow end, end up circling back to them. Oh, so yeah. um, I'm really curious, you know, what, what, can you tell us about your journey? Because I know you have an amazing journey. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, so... I think that the, the upshot of it is that I've discovered that what I'm doing now and, and, and I love what I'm doing now and I love what I'm doing now because I was meant to do it always. I was always meant to do this and I have tried doing other things and I've always found myself coming back to doing what I'm doing now, which is coaching. Um, my day job is as a university ombudsman. I'm an organizational ombudsman mm -hmm. and I literally spend my day uh, most of the time talking to people who come into my office uh, or call me on the phone, just devastated. You know, they're feeling um, overwhelmed, they're scared, um, they don't know what to do. It's a little bit of a, of, of a, of a joke. It's, a, you know, it's kind of funny, but my, my office is sometimes called the office of lost causes um, because uh, people, will send people to my office when they're done, when they are at their rope's end and, and they you know, find that they really have nothing else to suggest. And so sometimes my office is the office of last resort. And I so appreciate having people come in to my office, just you know, falling apart. And I sit down with them and listen and share empathy and uh, help, help them to reach a point where they can take breath and sit down and sit back and look at the situation. And then we try to, um, you know, organize all of the details that seem to be scattered all over the place and bring them into a form that is manageable so that they can um, discover uh, within all that mess, 
the answer that they're looking for that allows them to be able to move forward. Uh, so I, I like to say that I trick people into thinking that I've solved their problems. I call myself a problem solver. <laughs> <laughs> but the best part is when you get people to be able to solve their problems on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really genius thing. And I love doing that. And I, I love what I do every day. Mm -hmm. How did you how did you get started with this this work? Well, officially, I got started um, in law school, of all mm -hmm. things, you know, I had intended to go to law school um, to, to sue insurance companies. <laughs> That's a great, great uh, uh, intention. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with um, you on that one. <laughs> no. So my parents are both in medicine. My mom's a nurse practitioner. My dad's a pediatrician. And they had a private practice together. And after college, I worked for them for three years. And, you know, there had been an intention of me going to medical school and taking over the practice. But after three years working there, um, and in addition to other passions that I'd had, you know, going to law school was something that was in my path um, prior to that. But this, my experience during those three years just consolidated it, you know, it just made it sh sure that um, I was not going to go to medical school, I was going to law school. Mm -hmm. And um, and really some of the things that we experienced in the practice regarding insurance companies, um, I mean, it was just really awful. So I get into law school and, you know, after the basic six classes that you take, I was kind of set adrift because it wasn't what I expected. Mm -hmm. And for folks who are thinking about going to law school, you know, this is the thing that I will say to them, don't worry about that. <laughs> learn what you're supposed to learn. You'll be able to use it later. Yeah. But law school is not what it looks like on, on television. And, you know, the practice of law often isn't what it looks like on television. Um, and so I was kind of like, what, what am I doing here? You know, what, what, what exactly am I expecting to happen? And then in my third year, finally, in my third year, I took a negotiation seminar, my first semester of my third year. And then second semester, I took a, a, a mediation clinic. And that is where I discovered my purpose in life. You know, it took three years of law school, but finally I walked into this and I learned about alternative dispute resolution and about mediation. And I was like, I have discovered my passion. Uh, but there was a bit of a problem because my passion wasn't one that really paid. And so um, I did what most people coming out of law school want to do and did at the time, you know, because you've got enormous loans as you can understand, it also have being in a profession that required a yeah, lot of school. It's a lot of loans. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I went and I worked at a law firm on Wall Street mm -hmm. and I uh, was, you know, making great money and, you know, I was married and I uh, had an apartment in New York City and it looked like, you know, all the right things were happening. Right. Um, but I still felt like I'd sort of missed the the boat a little bit, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing and it was a great challenge and everything, but it wasn't my passion. Yeah. Um, and then I discovered my pr current profession. Uh, and the funny thing is that my first job as an, uh, as an ombudsman um, was back at my grad school and I didn't know the office existed. Oh. <laughs> So I went through three years of law school there, not knowing that the office existed. And it wasn't until I was in the law firm and my mentor who had been my mediation instructor reaches out to me and says, look, your talents are wasted in the law firm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've got this job. You've got to apply for this job. This is perfect for you. And I did. And I got the job and I discovered that, yes, this is what I was meant to do. So that's how I came to, you know, being um, a, an ombudsman uh, for, an organ for an organization, an organizational ombudsman. Mm -hmm. But still in that journey, you know, I, I love mediating. I didn't get as much of a chance to mediate as I wanted to. Um, we had anticipated this. I don't know, can you hear my babies? That, that, that's Bambi uh, uh, wanting to be on the show, <laughs> ladies <Yes>. and gentlemen. <laughs> he wanted to be on the show, which is, Totally, you know, I want to say it's totally normal because my cat Buster loved to jump onto the show as well. So I think there's something about, you know, us 
people, human, do we show that animal really in- intrigued? <laughs> I think that it's kind of nuts to them because like, who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> right, because they can't see people. Like, I'm curious who you're talking to. I want to see. <laughs> um, so yes, you may hear them from time to time. Um, but, you know, I- I've told people that I was coming on the show and that I was going to talk about how you can change your past. Yeah. Because in my development as a, as a mediator and as a coach and, and, and so forth, I have come to um, this, this understanding of this thing that's just so amazing. It's worked for me. I've worked with other people on it. And I'm eager to share mm-hmm. what I discovered about how it is that you can change your past. Mm-hmm. What happened is that, you know, during the time that I'm working at the law firm and I'm living the life and, and then, you know, as well as I moved to my uh, job as an ombudsman, associate ombudsman at, at, at Columbia, um, I also, you know, had this personal life. I was married and after we'd been married for about seven years, the next logical step to take, you know, we'd finish school, we have good jobs. What do you do next is you have a kid. Mm-hmm. And so we decided, okay, so it's time to start a family. And um, I went birth- off birth control actually uh, in, in April of that year for my birthday. Um, and just about two months later, I wound up in the emergency room with a ruptured ovarian cyst, oh. which is the most pain <laughs> that I had ever experienced in my life. Um, but you know, that happens sometimes. And, you know, the doctor told me that it can happen from time to time. Don't worry about it. You know, continue, you can continue trying to have kids Mm -hmm. about three months later, I'm back in the emergency room with another ruptured cyst. Three months after that, I'm back in the emergency room with another ruptured cyst. And at this point I'm like, wait, this is no, (laughs) right. Right. Yeah. It can be not acceptable. Yeah. Right. So I, finally found a doctor who listened to me (laughs) um, and performed surgery. And we discovered that by the time he performed surgery, I was at frozen pelvis, which is when, you know, all the organs in in the pelvic area are are, um, stuck together, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a very serious condition. And on top of that, he told me that, you know, I did have endometriosis. It's not curable. And my likelihood of being able to have children was pretty slim, if any. So as soon as I've recovered from from the surgery after the six weeks, we hop into um, an in vitro process. The in vitro process didn't work, you know, and we're stressed out and this sort of thing. And And my my, painful, right? Because you had to go through a lot of different injections and oh my gosh. In vitro. So it's not, it's not like, oh, I want to do in vitro. Great, you know, that's just do it. you actually require to do a lot of injection to get these hormone placements. Yes, and you know it's amazing that you know this uh, because for me anyway, my experience of it was it was terribly traumatic, honestly speaking, because I had to give the shots to myself. Yeah. And you know I had wanted my my husband to be my partner in this, yeah. and uh, he he refused to help me with, with the shots, you know? And there's a surreal moment that I remember where I'm standing in the kitchen, it's evening time, you have to take the shots at an exact specific time. And I see the clock and it's time to take the shot. And I just, I can't do it for my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just cringing at doing it. And he's there and I beg him, I said, please, can you give me the shot? And he refused. And I literally wound up chasing him down the hallway with this filled syringe and this needle <laughs> trying to get him. <laughs> <Give me a laughs> shot. <laughs> right, right now we're talking about this, that like, you know, this is something very funny. We see it as a comedy, yes. right? but at the moment, I'm pretty sure that's not what it feels like. No, you know, I was completely baffled. He wanted to have kids. He was supportive of this. And here in this moment when I need him most, he's kind of checked out, you know? And then there were other things that happened and there's one in particular, you know, there's like that, that needle um, or so that, that breaks the camel's back. Yeah. And so uh, I might've just uh, mixed up my metaphors, like needle in a haystack versus the straw, the straw. The straw, <laughs> and you, you know, funny, this is the second time I'm hearing about the camel and the straw. <laughs> 
with the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so, you know, here I am, I'm in excruciating pain most of the time. I mean, I ate Advil like it was candy, you know, um, just to remain functional. I'm still working at this moment. I'm the main breadwinner. And then I'm trying to maintain the house. You know, I'm cooking and doing the dishes and cleaning and all that sort of thing. And I asked him to do just two things. Mm -hmm. I asked him to take out the trash and to put his dirty clothes in the dirty clothes hamper. And I bought this nice, beautiful hamper. You couldn't miss it. And I placed it in the bedroom on the back wall right across from the door. I mean, it was just right there. And I would come home from work mm -hmm. and I would drag myself in tired and in pain. And I'd walk into the bedroom and there would be his dirty clothes next to the dirty clothes hamper. <laughs> <sighs> I'm pretty sure a lot of women can relate to that right now. Oh. <laughs> when I tell this story in workshops, the reaction, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, so beautiful, right? <laughs> and I was feeling really sorry for myself because I'm like, how are you doing? I'm I'm tortured here. And the little thing I ask you to do, that one little thing is just, and you know, what is he trying to say to me? Um, so as you can imagine, the the marriage didn't work out. And after 10 years, we were divorced mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I moved on. Um, leaving was my decision uh, and I was extraordinarily grateful to have been, you know, been able to move out of that, that relationship. It was terribly stressful, um, you know, being in it. And, and I experienced a lot of joy, actually. You know, I tell people, you know, I'm going through a divorce and they say, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, so I had that experience of it, but at the same time, you know, years later, I'm talking about seven, eight, nine, ten years later, I still found myself happy with my new life, but this pain would come back every so often and it would it, it just floor me, yeah. you know, and I didn't want it to be there anymore. I wanted to get rid of it so badly. You know, the analogy I think of is, you know, you survive an apocalypse mm -hmm. and you reach the promised land and you discover that your annoying neighbor has come with you, mm. right? Yeah. And it was just always still there. Yeah. And, you know, I teach this stuff. I teach communication, I teach mediation, I teach, and none of it seemed to be helping. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I discovered two things. I discovered nonviolent communication. Uh, and this actually was at Occupy Wall Street. I was a mediator at Occupy Wall Street. And we collaborated with folks who were practicing nonviolent communication. Uh, and so that's when I started to learn about that. And then I also discovered the law of attraction. Mm. And so, you know, I was able to put these two together to create a process that allowed me to be able to go back into the past and retell the story in a way that was enriching, that was empowering, that allowed me to let go of the rage, you know, and the hurt mm -hmm. that I had continued to feel even, you know, a decade after this had happened. It just had stayed with me. Yeah. And what I was able to do was to use a process in nonviolent communication. They call it oftener, which is O F N R. Oh, wow. Oftener. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teacher in my heart. What can I do? <laughs> so oftener, O F N R stands for observation, feeling, need, and request. And to use the process, first you make an observation about your situation. And I won't get into the details of you know, how that happens. It's just really important to separate um, evaluations from your observations so that you know, you're not, um, you're simply talking about the bare facts of what happened. So in the case of the laundry basket, I would say, you know, I came home from work at six o'clock on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I walked into my bedroom and saw the dirty clothes on the floor next to the dirty clothes hamper. So facts. The eval Pardon? Facts. Facts, that's it. Just facts. Exactly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to do that first, okay? 
And then the next step is about the feelings. How did I feel about that? And in, in nonviolent communication, you know, really important aspect about feelings is sort of at the foundation of nonviolent communication is the understanding that your feelings are important indicators of when your needs are being met or not being met. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're feeling happy, you're feeling content, you're feeling hopeful, you're feeling accomplished, um, those are indications of your needs being met. Mm -hmm. When you're feeling sad or angry or, or despondent, um, you, those are indications of your needs not being met. Mm -hmm. Right, I said feelings being met, your needs, your needs not being met. And so in that situation, I said to myself, okay, so I've made this observation, how did I feel? And I felt awful, of course, right? I felt um, irate, I felt um, disappointed, I felt trapped, you know? Although I'll back up for a second, for people who are familiar with nonviolent communication, they all said just now, trapped is not a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> that is totally a feeling to me. Right. <laughs> I'm feeling trapped. <laughs> I say that all the time, I'm feeling trapped. <laughs> right, well, you know, I felt stuck. <laughs> right. So um, Right. And, you know, if, if people are interested in del delving into the details of nonviolent communication, I strongly um, encourage them to check out the book, Nonviolent Communication. Uh, you know, it's, it's out there, it's available, and I recommend it to everybody. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I had all of these really difficult feelings that I was dealing with. Well, then the next step is N, which is needs, and that is to explore, well, what needs did I have that were not being met? And what's great about this is that you can do it in the present, and then you can also do it in the past, right? And you can do it for yourself, and you can do it with another person. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, I'm doing it for myself, and I'm trying to identify these needs. Well, you know, I, I, I needed care, and love, and concern, and cooperation, and consideration, you know, all of these things that would have enriched my life, especially in that very difficult time. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So then you get to the next step, which is the R, and R stands for requests. Mm -hmm. What requests can I make of myself to fulfill those needs? And so in, in the fact that I'm doing this in the past, I re recognize that I, I did make a request of myself and I fulfilled that request, which is that I got out of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I had done that for myself. Mm -hmm. But there was still something missing because yes, I can do that for myself and I can recognize all those things, mm -hmm. but there's still the fact of the matter that what was he thinking? And why did he do this to me? And you know, what was it about me that made me so undeserving of his care and attention that he would be that just you know, inconsiderate? And that's the source of the rage. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the source of the anger and the hurt, the pain that won't go away. So I needed to address that too. And this is the magical part, at least this was the magical part for me, was that I said, okay, so let me think back and do this oftener as though it were he you know, who, who's doing it, I'm doing it for him. Mm -hmm. And I made the observation. And the observation is that I have this medical condition that is not being diagnosed, mm -hmm. that is chronic, that lands me in the emergency room and is obviously getting worse and there's no answer in sight. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered something very important about my ex-husband's background. Mm -hmm. When he was nine years old, his mother contracted cancer. And, you know, he's a nine-year-old kid. Nobody was talking to him. Nobody was telling him what was going on. It was a big mystery for him. All he could see was, was that his beloved mother, um, and he was very, very close to her. She was, he was his, her eldest son, you know, and they had a very tight relationship. So this woman whom he loves, whom he depends on for nurture and for care, is getting sick and sicker and sicker. And eventually she goes into the hospital and he did tell me once about how he visited her in the hospital once and how it terrified him. Mm -hmm. And so she goes into the hospital 
And then the next thing he knows, she never comes home. Hmm. And that pain is something that I know defines him and defines who he is as a person. And so here it was that I, at the same age that his mother was, mm -hmm. when she got sick and passed away, have contracted this illness. Nobody's explaining what's going on. I'm getting sicker and sicker. I have to go into the hospital. There are all these needles and doctors and, and that's when the magic happened. And I recognized, I said, whoa, he was living his nine-year-old nightmare yeah. all over again. And I can imagine that it so terrified him that he was just unable to cope mm -hmm. and that he kind of regressed into his nine-year-old self. And what tools, what emotional tools are available to a nine-year-old at that point, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, to somebody when they're nine years old, you know, what do you have available? Not much. Yeah. And so I completely understood why he ran away from me. Mm -hmm. When I have this needle and he's in the hallway, he was terrified. Um, I understood why he couldn't really be there for me in the way that I had expected to him as expected him to be like, as you know, as a man, as a husband, um, and so forth, because it turns out that this particular situation was so reminiscent of the terror that he experienced as a child, mm -hmm. that he just he just fell apart. Um, now, the sort of <laughs> ironic thing is that I discovered this in, but in, in front of a bunch of other people because I was actually in the middle of conducting a workshop on nonviolent communication. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you're standing there and here's my aha moment. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I like, just realized something. <laughs> yes. It was exactly like that. You know, I'm going through the OFNR and everything. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I need to come up with an example, right? And that's the one that popped into my head just right then. Yeah. You know, it was with a group of women. So I knew that they would understand the laundry situation. And that was, you know, and so as we're going through it, I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, whoa. Um, and yeah. it was a big deal because <laughs> it was a big deal because I literally physiologically felt, you know, the pressure go away and the anger go away and that like that noose, you know, that I had had around my neck and I'm like dragging this pain and this hurt, you know, I just felt it just disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've been able to use this process for other situations as well, where I'm able to provide empathy for myself and empathy for the other person, even if they're not there to participate in it, you know, and there is a process for doing it when the other person is there and they're available to participate in the process. Um, and, you know, you can find all this in, in, in the book in nonviolent communication, mm -hmm. but that's what I wanted to share really, you know, um, the law of attraction tells us that you get more of what you think about. Mm -hmm. And so if you're focused on what you don't want, mm -hmm. you're going to get more of that. And I was really focused on what I didn't want. And it was something that was becoming you know, really strong in my life, even though my intent was to let it go. Yeah. And so what they tell you in the law of attraction is don't think about it. Think about something else. Right. Right. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't working for me. And so I was able to, and I needed to go back into the past and reformulate the story so that, you know, it's not as though you change the facts, the facts didn't change at all, but what it meant was transformed for me. And that was able to, that's how I was able to transform that pain um, into understanding. Yeah, I, I have a process, which I, I do to some of my client who's showing up as having the same pattern of energy that they keep going back. And there's an energy of that they avoidance, right? They want to get rid of it. It's uncomfortable. It's fear. It, they don't want it. There's part of us that we don't want. And, and I do this process of self-integration. I call it self-integration. Mm -hmm. And basically it's exactly what you described. You know, you go back to a specific time when this is all started and remembering you know what was that in that moment that was missing what's what's been what you need to remember about that incident and and bring it back and bring it as part of you so like I think a lot of audience and a lot of uh, um, listener who's watching they may be at a place where they're trying to get rid of the fear 
because fear is not something that's very present. It's not, it's not something that we want. We don't want to live in a, in a world full of fear. And, and right now it's a perfect example of yes. living in a fear, right? So people want to get rid of the fear. They want to push it away. They, it's not something that it's wanted in their life. But we don't realize that when we push something away, more power it has on us, mm-hmm. right? So yes. it's about resistance, right? The right. more you resist something, the more of it you get. Yeah, and I love how you open up to explore and just be curious about, you know, what was creating all this? You know, I want to understand it. And you actually went back and remember what was it about that moment, even though you were standing in front of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> universe just has its weird way of working on us right oh yeah it doesn't pick a time and place for us to have that aha moment and <laughs> you know there's so many things you know that you just share that you know I felt this is something that you're really passionate about and and I, I can see I can feel that passion that's coming out from you and your journey has just been amazing and that you're able to pull yourself through. And there's a, a lot of resilience coming out from you. And you're just, oh, you're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, I'm, well, really just, happy and ha- I'm really happy that you, um, you came on to the show because I think this is a topic that a lot of women, men too, because you know we have that experience where it's unpleasant. We went through it yet there's something else that's in there that we want to go back and just kind of understand, you know, what was going on so that it becomes, you know, our entire, entire self, the complete self. Yeah. So if people would like to um, find you or get hold of you, how do they, how do they do that? So uh, I have a YouTube channel that's launching next week on April 9th. It's called Chaos and Flow is the name of my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And so they can look out for that. Um, I did of course have plans for a fabulous landing page and a website and all of these things. Um, I'm working on an ebook and I'm about 70% there. (laughs) (laughs) Do do we have a title for the ebook? The, so it's the, the subtitle, I don't necessarily have a title, but the subtitle is, you know, how you can learn that everything is always working out for you. Mm, everything is that. always working out for you. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Because mm, a lot yeah. of us think that, you know, everything is against us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fabulous thing about that when you come to realize it is that whatever you say is happening in your life is Mm -hmm. true. So if you say everything's against me, guess what? That's true. Mm -hmm. And if you say everything is working for me, even if I can't see it right now, it's true. Uh, And it's a marvelous thing to be able to have, you know, some perspective in your life and be able to look back. You know, there's more to the story. I wound up living in a tent and dumpster diving for food for a while. Um, you know, <laughs> after- wow, that, I have to, I have to invite you back to another show because <laughs> like the whole day talking about your, your <laughs> right. You know, so I'm living in a tent of dumpster diving for food and, and, and now that I look back on it and it was fine, actually, the, you know, I will tell the story about how I found it to be an, a huge adventure and I actually loved it, you know, but, um, looking back on it now, I recognize that that was supposed to happen. You know, so there were really great things that were able to happen or that, that happened after that. You know, that was a springboard. That experience was a springboard to wonderful things, to other wonderful things. Yeah. So even when, you know, I mentioned playing my guitar and singing on subway platforms. Well, that wasn't only for fun. I needed the money, mm-hmm. right? So, um, you know, I literally was a a busker, you know, some people would call it begging. I don't think it was begging necessarily, but, you know, I was on the platform playing for tips. Um, And a lot of people might look at that and think, oh my gosh, you know, that must be rock bottom. You've got two Ivy League degrees, you're a lawyer, and you're scraping for money on the subway platform in New York City. Um, And that is a way to look at it. You certainly can look at it that way. And then there's another way to look at it, which was, it was 
the most substantive experience of my life. You know, the people whom I met, the experiences that I got to have, you cannot, you know, make this, it, it, it's unparalleled. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing in conventional life that sets you up for the experiences that I was able to have on that subway platform mm -hmm. um, or living in a tent and learning how to dumpster dive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was an amazing learning experience and um, an experience full of joy, even though another way of looking at it was, you know, that's absolute failure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you can choose again, you know, you, you choose what your past is. You choose what your future is. We yeah. are all empowered to do that. So, and, and I'm really glad that you brought this up because I think one of the, one of the biggest things that people are going through right now is the unemployment rate is really high. Yes. Right? And a lot of people are actually in the, in the midst of losing their job. They don't know where their food is going to come from. So, and, and you and I came from that, we came around from that journey of having, having experienced something that's like the rock bottom and coming here. How, what, what would you um, recommend to people who's currently going through and perhaps they're not, they don't believe that this is possible? So, you know, you're, you're asking a really important question and one that I have been pondering for quite some, some time mm -hmm. because the answer when a person is in the midst of a situation like that mm -hmm. and they don't believe that it can get better the answer that i have to give is not one that they're ready for at that time yeah you know all i can do at that time all i would do at that time is to be able to sit with them and empathize with them and you know find help where i can and you know really um focus on that basic material you know sustenance kind of thing mindset you know we can work on that later <laughs> yes but, yes and, I, and it really you know surprised me sometimes you know uh there are people who's pushing them to go move forward or friends yes. you know friends they come across they would say oh you know you're just gonna have to get up and move move and do this you got this but it's really hard to believe and i i know that because i have people who told me oh michelle you're gonna pull through this you're gonna be a different person no i didn't believe it and, yes. and that's okay. That's okay yes. that you don't in that moment. Yes, because you know what? It will work out for you anyway. It will work out for you anyway. And the fabulous part about it is that often the way that it works out is a way that you couldn't have even imagined. Yeah. You know, um, people will walk into your life. Opportunities will open up that you didn't see coming. Uh, and, you know, for folks who are going through it right now, what I can encourage them to do, if they can, is to sit back and think of other hard times back in their lives. You know, there are other things that they have gone through where um, it looked hopeless and, and they got through it. Um, you know, resources showed up, whatever it was, but they were able to get through it. And then I encourage folks for, you know, going forward, to de develop, you know, I call it your faith muscle. Mm. Develop your faith muscle so that you can so believe. You make it. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you, absolutely. Fake yeah. it till you make it. Because what happens when you're faking it, you know, is that you're gathering up the energy that allows the inspiration to come, that allows for you to see that magical opportunity. Um, you know, I was living in the tent and my parents were like, winter is coming. What are you doing? <laughs> you <know? laughs> I have my bed. Should we look for a job? Um, and literally it was an afternoon in, in Chicago. I had uh, been able to fly to Chicago to visit my brother and my parents were there. And we just on a whim opened up the computer, you know, there in the kitchen, all four of us were there and there was a blog that I know of that lists jobs. And so I opened it up and, oh my gosh, the perfect job was, was right there. Right there. <laughs> it was right there. And so with, with the help of my family, I wrote my um, application and it submitted it. I mean, we're talking about, you know, span of 45 minutes. I yeah. submitted it. And three months later, I had the job, Yeah. you know, and I'm back earning six figures. I own my house now. You know, I have my wonderful dogs. Um, I, I love where I work and the community that I'm with. Mm -hmm. And 
it was just this moment that I could not have imagined, you know, two days before living in the tent. I'm still thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. And in the span of 45 minutes, my life completely changes, you know, and that's how it happens. That's how it works. And so if I can offer any encouragement, you know, if I can offer words of hope, um, it is that as dark and deep as it looks right now, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Always. So beautiful. Yeah. I, I couldn't have closed it any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. And just follow that passion. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I had a great time speaking with you. Um, and for those of you who's interested in follow uh, Batapoli, I will absolutely link all the information on the post so that you can follow her, you can track her down and, and buy her ebook. And the chaos and flow yes. is going to come out next week, right? YouTube. YouTube channel. Yes, that is the, the, the channel, my posting videos, yes. Yep. And hopefully my ebook will be available at that time too. <laughs> the ebook is coming out soon. I, yes. I know you got this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take one moment. Uh, I don't want to forget to congratulate you, Michelle. I'm so proud of you. You achieved your ACC certification. Yay! Yay! <laughs> I know, I was so excited about that. So for those of you who don't know what ACC is, it's basically Associated Coach, Certified Coach. And this is internationally uh, coaching federation recognized, it's accredited by ICF. Um, and you have to meet certain requirements and hours. And yeah, I'm just really thrilled. Thank yeah. you so much. You're right, I'm right behind you, girl. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I got you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you all for watching. I hope you, this is something that's very valuable and especially very needed at the time like this. So, you know, thank you so much for sharing. It was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.